Hey everyone, uh, if you're hearing my voice, you are in the right spot for this afternoon's webinar from the Princeton Review on MCAT strategy. We're going to give it a few minutes to make sure all of your uh, friends out there across the US and Canada are able to get logged in and set up for to, uh, tonight's webinar. So just a, a couple of quick things. I'm not going to go through a full introduction just yet, but please know that you are all on mute. So if you're trying to talk to us uh, as you go and you're wondering why uh, we're not hearing you, it's because we try to keep our um, background noise down during these sessions by keeping all attendees on mute. Uh, second thing is that we'll need you to practice your skills by finding your way to the questions section. So depending on whether you're logged in on your mobile or if you're on a desktop, that question section is in a different spot. Uh, if you're on your mobile, it's down in the middle part of your screen. You'll see a giant question mark. And if you are on a desktop, it should be somewhere pocketed on the right uh, where you're able to bring it out from your screen by clicking the little box with the arrow on it. That'll make the questions box bigger. So if you can just say hi to our team and, and tell us where you are logging in from this afternoon uh, or uh, evening, depending on where you are, uh, it would be great. And it's a great way for you also to be able to practice all of your questions. So that way you can send all of your MCAT questions uh, to the way of our presenter today. So do find your way to that question section, say hello. We're gonna give it just another minute. I will redo this entire introduction so you'll get to hear it one more time just to make sure you're listening uh, and just to make sure we catch anybody else. And we'll get started here uh, with tonight's MCAT strategy session in just a few minutes. So welcome everybody. All right, everybody, lots of people feverishly getting logged in uh, this afternoon. Welcome to the Ross University School of Medicine and American University School of the Caribbean School of Medicine uh, MCAT strategy session in partnership with the Princeton Review. Uh, my name is Katie Gillis. I'm the Senior Director of Student University Partnerships here. I will be your MC this afternoon uh, as we kick into this wonderful topic of getting you prepped for your MCAT. So just a couple of things. Um, in tonight's session, if you haven't already, please find your way to the question section. So again, if you're on a mobile, it's typically located at the bottom of the screen. There's a question mark. If you hit that, it will take you to the question section where you can then type in where you're logging in from. Also let us know maybe where you're attending school um, and any of those pieces. Uh, and just anything else that you'd like to say about where you are uh, within the US, Canada, or around the world today, that would be helpful. Uh, we will say hi back to you there. But as we go throughout today's webinar, we also will want you to make sure that you guys use that question section so that we um, can make sure to give our esteemed presenter all of your time and attention and all of your most important questions uh, throughout the webinar. So also um, in the chat and then also in the handout section in both sections, uh, there is registration with a bit.ly link, B-I-T-L-Y, if you don't know what bit.ly means, uh, where you can actually register for a giveaway that the Princeton Review is doing for attendees of tonight's webinar. So please either find your way to the chat to grab that bit.ly or in the handout section, uh, it'll take you to Princeton Review site. Please enroll there. Uh, with your email address and you're going to be a part of tonight's giveaway and um, our, our our presenter has a, a lot of great things in store for you so if you want to be part of that giveaway please make sure that you find your way into the chat and into the handout section to just grab that bit.ly link and make sure that you get signed up uh, for all of the goodies 
So again, you're all on mute throughout tonight's session, um, just to make sure that the listening quality is good for anybody attending the session uh, and making sure that everybody can hear appropriately. So please use that question section as much as possible. We will make sure that all of your questions get to uh, the Princeton Review uh, and Sean Crick, who I'm about to introduce here to y'all in just a minute. Uh, we're gonna have a wonderful webinar. So again, question section, uh, check out the, the uh, chat and the handout section to get that bit.ly to sign up for the giveaways from the Princeton Review tonight, if you wanna be included in that. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, point it over to Sean Crick. So Sean, if you wanna go ahead and turn on your camera uh, and we will pass it over to you to talk all things Princeton Review and MCAT Strategy Session. So Sean, I'll let you uh, do your introduction. Sean and I match shirts today on purpose, uh, just because we were thinking warm and sunny, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. So Sean, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, thank you so much, Katie. And yes, we have those sunny dis dispositions, so we need to dress like it, right? Um, okay. So thank you everybody for, for coming today. Um, it's a privilege to talk with you all and, and to, um, to be working with, with Katie and everyone uh, at Ross and ACU. And uh, today uh, we're gonna go over some of the concepts of the MCAT, really understand this test, you know, this, this beast that's in front of you. My goal is by the end of, of this hour, you'll understand much more um, about the test, about what you're going to be facing, and you'll understand a bit about how it's put together and how you can handle it, how you can actually overcome that. Um, so just starting off, you know, according to a survey from National Medical School students, over 90% of students who took the MCAT um, took it more than once. And um, now think about that. And now if you're if you're a medical school and you're, and you're looking at that, um, all of the students have taken the same pre-med courses, right? And if they've gone in and they've taken the test once, and then they've come back and taken the test again. Did they learn biology again? Did they learn sociology again? Did they learn chemistry again? Absolutely not. They learned what they were up against and they learned techniques and how to deal with it. So we're going to go over some of those things today and arm you with that. And the three main things we're gonna go over together are what is the MCAT? Okay, we're gonna start really general um, with that and understanding it, um, understanding its mechanisms and, and how it runs and when it runs and everything that you're gonna need to know there. And then finally, we'll get to strategies of the MCAT, but I, I say that number three is really strategies of the MCAT because all of this is strategy for the MCAT. I'm proud of all of you right now for being at this webinar and for giving yourself this knowledge and taking it a level up. So congratulations on that. And we'll go through some of it together. Now, um, a little bit just about um, who I am. Who, who is this, this guy who thinks he can tell me about the MCAT? Um, <laughs> good question. And my name is, is Sean Cricks. I work with the Princeton Review, and I've been with the company for about 12 years. I, um, I started teaching for the Princeton Review after being a content developer and test writer for another company for a continuing education university. So um, the Princeton Review was interested in me teaching, and unfortunately I did such a good job teaching that I was promoted in, into management um, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And um, now I, I'm the specialist of, of outreach for Central Florida and for um, Puerto Rico, Virgin Islands. Um, I've also been the director of business development for the Southeast. I've held operations roles and I've worked with thousands, literally thousands of students, helping them to get into med school. So um, although I love being in the classroom, being in this capacity allows me to advise and empower um, more students than I could possibly in the classroom. So I'll get to share some of my knowledge about the MCAT with you today, and then also some of those specific strategies that I've, I've actually practiced with my students. I've actually, you know, I 
we're Facebook, we're all Facebook friends now. Um, it's never bad to have a doctor as a Facebook friend and one who owes you a favor. Maybe that's a good reason to be a, a teacher for the MCAT. So um, going over, you know, before we get into the specific strategies or, you know, what you need to get a high, high score and everything, we need to just cover real quick what the MCAT is and, um, you know, the purpose of the MCAT. And so, you know, we'll start with the simple question, what does it stand for? right building blocks here so it's the medical college admissions test that's right and now is this is one of the few tests um, that is made with the express purpose of getting you into one type of program uh, for example you know the gre the you know graduate requisite exam you could take that for a number of different fields um, you, if you're taking the GMAT, likely you're going into business school. Um, and the MCAT is, is unique in that it's owned by the folks who will be processing your applications. Um, so the AAMC is the, um, is the owner and the administrator, the creator, the ruler of the MCAT. So the first tip I'm going to give you is to make sure that you are registered with the AMC, um, that if you are even considering taking the MCAT in the next couple of years, you want every phone and annoying text update you possibly can get from them um, because they announce changes in the test, they announce new test dates. Uh, you really need to be in their circle. And we are constantly, you know, monitoring what they're doing. So you can see a lot of it at the Princeton Review, but please subscribe to AAMC. And this, uh, the medical school admission test, medical college admissions test is required by all US and Canadian medical schools. And that is for both the MD and the DO programs. So it used to be when DO was, you know, a little newer, it was a little more lax, but not not now. So um, now knowing the, the dates, the, the seasons of the MCAT is very important. There are some types of exams that are offered weekly. This is not one of those exams. Uh, this is off, offered very seldom. You know, you've got select dates and uh, in January, March, April, May, June, July, August, and September. And I mean very select, like just a couple of, of days out of the month or maybe three days out of that month. They are offering right now um, because of COVID-19 and um, it, in that the need for social distancing, they do offer it in the morning and in the evening, right? But you're gonna find that, that these will fill up very, very quickly and you want to make sure that you're on notice about, you know, when these test dates are announced. Um, for example, they, they've announced the first part of the year now, and we're, we're all waiting to find out what are, the, what are the dates going to be towards the end of the year. And, I mean, if you think it's hard as an undergraduate, you know, getting the courses that you want when uh, registration opens, just imagine what it's like trying to grab that test date that just came out. So one rule, though, is they, they won't allow you to register for more than one date at a time. So choose your date, choose wisely, and I, I think we'll go over some of that, um, but towards the, you know, the end of your junior year, um, and, and choose wisely and allow yourself to, to take some time to prep. And whether that be a course or a book that you picked up, um, whatever it is, just you need to prepare and understand this exam. So, and it can only be taken uh, three times in a, in a year. It can be taken four times in two consecutive years or seven times total. Now here comes Sean with a little of advice. Just because you can do something doesn't mean that you should. And after dealing with uh, hundreds of administrators, of admissions counselors, schools, um, and student groups over the years, I can tell you that it doesn't look good for you if you're going to go past two attempts, three attempts, right? Because as I mentioned at the beginning, 
when you go in and you take the exam and you don't do so well, and then you come back in three months and you nail it, well, that tells a, a good story. That tells a story of a student who went to and took an exam, didn't do as well as they thought, went back, rolled their sleeves off, got the work done, figured out how to do that test, came back and did it. That's a good student. Not necessarily the first one that hits it, hits it out of the ballpark the first time. It's very, very rare, right? 10%. So, but a after three times, now, okay, well, what, what's going on here? What are they missing? And if you're getting into four, five, six times, I mean, obviously, for lack of a better word, I, I've, I've heard like the term, you know, hacking, um, trying, trying to hack, the, hack in, into the MCAT. So you just want to be careful with there and, and don't always do what, what you can. So the AMC is very clear about what they see, uh, the purpose of the MCAT. In fact, when, when you take the MCAT, you have to sign that you're expressly taking this um, for medical school, which is interesting. So if anybody ever tells you that um, they are they, they help people prepare for the MCAT and they haven't applied to medical school, if they tell you they have actually taken the MCAT, that is incorrect. Um, or they committed some, <laughs> they, it's, it's incorrect. So um, keep that in mind. I have only taken practice MCAT tests for years and years and years and years and years. And uh, so, but they, they want you to understand that it's going to be standardized, right? It's going to be multiple choice. Now, I want you to start thinking of these strategically. So look for your opportunity in each one of these statements uh, that it's, it's multiple choice. Okay, great, it's not free answer. Designed to assess your problem solving, critical thinking and knowledge of natural, behavioral, and social science concepts and principles prerequisite to the study of medicine, all right? Great, so you see they're, they're not being very specific. They're not saying, you know, your knowledge of biography, or biology, I'm sorry. Um, what they're looking for is they want you to demonstrate uh, your, your knowledge and, and how you can apply it and how you can apply theory and how you can solve problems. And being a CARS instructor, um, I can tell you that there are a lot of tools that you can use for CARS and you wouldn't think so. When the, uh, when the MCAT is scored, usually the biggest variance is going to be in your CARS section because it does me measure cognitive you know, aptitude at the time, but it also measures um, whether or not you know what you're doing that day. Um, so what's going to be, you know, required? What do you need to make sure that you've done before you're taking this exam or, or preparing for this exam? And here it is, folks, right here. Um, a lot of people think that it's going to get into advanced physics or chemistry, um, you know, so sociology. Um, but here you can see We've got in your sciences, um, your, your, your general sciences, your biology, your physics, um, general chemistry, organic chemistry, that's gonna be about a year's work. Now, it's not so neat and clean for everyone. So that's why it's really, you're thinking the end of your junior year. You might not get that physics class that you wanted as a freshman. Um, you might not make it into that biochem class that you really need. And it is good to take both part one and two. Um, you know, being taking part two can help you in understanding how to apply part one even better. But just as uh, those of you who took the SAT or the ACT understand they, they weren't testing you on anything you learned your senior year, they, they can't because you had to take it before that. Same thing here. So. Don't wait too long. Make sure that you have the correct timing. So now the scoring is really odd and there's a very long complicated explanation for it that I don't think you really care about. So let's just go over um, the things that you do care about, which is what are they gonna ask me and how can I make a difference in my score and what does it matter? 
So uh, just by you know signing in and and getting your name on the on the test that day and opening it up, you're going to get a 472. Congratulations. And the highest score that you could possibly get is a 528. So, you know, what's the deal with, with that, that point spread? Really, what we need to know is, that, is where we need to be. So the mean score for everyone taking the test is a 500, okay? Now, uh, the mean score in each section is about a 125. But let's put that into a little bit of perspective. So getting into medical school is extremely difficult. And I know you understood that, but let's look at some hard numbers here, okay? So in 2019 to 2020, we had, in that school year, we had the 873, 819 applicant, applications were submitted, all to AAMC, member medical schools. And that was those were sent in by 53,371 different students. So that works out to 17 applications per student. That's how many schools everyone is applying to. Uh, and finally, in the end, only 21,869, about 22,000, uh, ended up actually matriculating in the medical school. So that's just 41% of the applicants who end up actually in medical school. Now, there's much more that you need than just an MCAT score that will get you into medical school. You need, you know, interviews, your research, your experience, and your performance in college, you know, your grade point average. But MCAT score it does matter. Now, uh, earlier we saw what the mean is, right, for this, but uh, that's not relevant to you. You want to get into medical school. You don't just want to take the MCAT. So what what are relevant numbers? Well, for applicants, it actually ended up in 2018. Um, from 2019, it got a little bit harder. So we were looking at a 506. Now, who actually got in, though? Those are the folks who had a mean of, two, of 511, 511 and a half. Now, also notice that the grade point average mean is very, is pretty high, and especially for the matriculates. That's a 372, a 373, and, um, and you know, for your total of, of your 22,000 matriculates. And it's, it's crucial to make sure that you always keep a balance of your activities, your experiences, uh, your grade point average and your your MCAT study because unfortunately your MCAT is going to be weighted as heavily as your grade point average is. Is that fair? No, no. Um, but um, life is not fair. Like my uncle used to say when I said life is not fair, he would say, "Well, Sean, let's go find the guy who said it was and beat him up." Um, so life is not fair. We're going to have to work hard at this, folks, and we can do it. So here are some uh, so a bunch of random numbers. No, there, there are percentiles, which mean a little bit more than looking at the you know the chart that I just showed you, um, and looking at you know 510 versus 508 versus 5. what does it mean? What does that mean to me? And this is a great way to see what that actually means to you. So getting a 510 actually triples your chances of getting into medical school. It's not a magic number, you know, or anything. It's not, it's not a, a magic uh, formula, but that on average is, is, is what uh, has panned out. Now, as you go up, each point is so, is so crucial. As you go up from a 510, where you're in the 82nd percentile, so you're top 18%, you get one more point, now you're in the top 15%. Get two more points, you're in top 11%. Get a few more points than that, we're at, look at 515, right? Where we have a 515 guarantee course. That's 93 percentile. That means you're in the top 7% of all test takers. And as you can see, as you're going up, it gets more and more important. I find it interesting you can get a 523, which is five points lower than a 528. 
and still be in the 100th percentile. But they will see your score, not just your percentile. But I wanted to show you this is just kind of so you can see your place in all these numbers and, and what that really, you know, would mean to you. So getting into our second main, main point uh, of this uh, lesson is understanding the MCAT. And, you know, now that we know what it is and who makes it and, and that, and, and before we get any detail on specific, you know, questions about them, the strategy we can use, we need to discuss what the MCAT's like overall. You know, before you earn, learn any other strategy, you need to have an understanding of the MCAT as a test. So the sections of the MCAT are worded much more difficultly than difficultly than they need to be. But we have our chemical and physical foundations of biological systems. We have the best section ever, CARS, um, your critical analysis and reasoning skills, which yes, there are hacks. And um, biological and biochemical foundations of living systems. And then a relatively new one, if you've been in, the, uh, in, in test prep for years, the psychological, social, and biological foundations of behavior. And, um, and that previously was an essay. And the problem with essays is that humans have to grade them. And the problem with humans is that they're expensive by the hour. So there are so many applications that a few years ago, the AAMC said, okay, we, we can't keep up with these essays. Um, so we're going to build in a, a psycholo psychology and sociology section. And finally, ac actually test people on things like, what will their bedside manner be like? Um, is that important? <laughs> it is to me. So what skills are you gonna, you're, you're going to need? Um, it's not presented like, like trivia about college level science. Um, scientific reasoning and inquiry skills that students need to succeed uh, on, on the exam uh, are, are critical. And in fact, almost all MCAT questions are phrased in some way that makes you use some kind of scientific knowledge or inquiry. So using the AAMC's language, which I always do when I can, you need to show knowledge of specific concepts and principles on the MCAT. And that doesn't mean you have to show all of your knowledge. It means you have to understand some concepts. So, for example, you see a genetics question, you'll likely need to de deploy a opponent square to get the answer, right? Um, but you'll be likely to get the, the correct answer without completing the questions um, if, you, if you have strategies. Uh, behind it. We're going to learn how to approach things the right way, not do things the long way. I mean, when's the last time you did long division? So uh, scientific reasoning and problem solving is the next area that they want to cover. And usually that involves being given a description of scientific research with some results provided, and then you're asked to extrapolate further conclusions from that. So it's not researching, your, your, it's not memorizing your research. It's memorizing how to research and analysis there. So, and then similarly, the AAMC wants students to demonstrate an understanding of reasoning about the design and execution of research. So you could be provided with a detailed explanation of, of the scientific research, but your task is to spot the flaws in it. And then finally, um, you've got, data-based and statistical reasoning. So you'll need to understand how to analyze subjects with graphs and statistics. So pay, pay attention to those classes. Um, you can't walk into the MCAT thinking you're gonna do well by knowing biology and physics and having you know, your notes memorized from class. You're gonna be required to demonstrate your very specific scientific knowledge in a very specific manner, a standardized manner. So you'll also be showing um, some of your other life skills here, right? So here's a few tips about the actual day that you are taking the test. Make sure that you always arrive 30 minutes early. 
I would say during COVID-19, you want to arrive an hour early. Where? They're at Pearson's and other testing centers. So you will be taking this in person. Um, as I mentioned, there's different times throughout the day, so you will be socially distanced. Uh, but you will be doing pro, um, prometrics or biometrics. Um, it is very, very strict. It is harder to get into the take the MCAT than it is to get on an airplane. So expect metal detectors, expect fingerprint palm verification, expect to have your pockets empty, expect you know all of that. So make sure you have everything there with you. And they want to make sure it's secure, right? And and then that's a, that's a good thing. And the computerized uh, testing system um, it displays in in different in a, in a very specific way, which is one way we can look at strategy, right? We can under we can know this the chessboard or the checkerboard. We can know how the pieces move in the different games, and um, and you're provided certain materials, right? Everyone's provided with the same materials throughout. And here's what that day looks like. You've got your test day, you know, certification, um, a tutorial which is never optional, please don't opt out of a tutorial. And then you'll go right into chemical and physical foundations and biological systems. And you'll have 95 minutes in that section, 59 questions. You can jump all over the place and answer the questions in the order you want to or passages in the order you want to, but you cannot actually switch between sections. So you are in there for that 95 minutes. And then there's a break, uh, optional, it's not optional, take a break. And you'll go right into cars. And that'll be 90 minutes, 90 minutes, the 90 best minutes of your life, that car section. And followed by that, you'll get some lunch and go back for some biological, biochemical foundations of living systems. Again, 59.95, uh, which gives you about a minute, 30 seconds to a minute and 40 seconds per question including the reading material so this is a race this is a marathon seven hours and 27 minutes but it is a race if we were able to take this home we would probably all get in the top 10 percentile so that is a key strategy to understanding the the test is that multiple choice all questions are equal a difficult question is not worth any more points than a simple question, which gets us into some of our techniques. Now, here's the board, right? Here's what you exactly what you will see when you are taking the MCAT. Now, what else do you have with you? You have your trusty, well, it's, it's way over there. You have this little whiteboard thing that's not a whiteboard, but it is, but it's not. And it's and you have a marker, and so you can do your notes on that, and you can raise your hand, and they'll come and, and replace it and give you another one. Um, and you will also have a highlighting tool, and that highlighting tool you can see up here in the presentation. The highlighting tool allows you to highlight both in a passage, if it's passage based, and also in the question stem over here so um, th this is great because when you're going through and and you're you know you're taking a few notes and what i recommend is that you just jot down like you're going to be doctors so start doctor style right just a few main points that that you notice in each one or if you've previewed the questions which is a really good idea um, then you know what you're looking for in the passage and that's what you're highlighting or you can highlight things like according to the passage, uh, because that is a key indicator of what kind of question type it is. So, highlighter. We have the highlighter, we have our dry erase, not a dry erase board, wet erase board, and we have our periodic table. So, that's right, everybody. You don't need to memorize the periodic table. I mean, maybe you do for class, but you don't. Uh, to take the MCAT. It's right there. You just click on that button and it'll pop right open for you. And you have your next button and you would also have a back button, but this is the first one, first passage. 
All right. So now we get down to some juicy stuff. Um, we understand, though, you know, why why we had to go over all that. We needed to understand what what it was, what the 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 three hundred uh, the three mile view is, right? The the uh, the beta view here, the meta view of what's going on. Now we can zero in a little bit on some of these strategies that can help you. And these are general test taking strategies here. So as I as I alluded to earlier, when you read something, look at it as an opportunity or a challenge, not as an obstacle. So when you read, you know, chemical and biological systems of you know, or you're like, oh, I'm going to have to do critical analysis and reasoning. Okay. Well, first of all, look, we understand this exam. We know exactly how long it's going to be. We know exactly how many questions are on it. We know exactly how long we're going to have to do each question. We know what people are scoring around us. We know what we need to score exactly. And we're going to learn how we can actually outsmart the exam. And the first thing, as I alluded to earlier, is it's multiple choice. Fantastic. We don't have to actually think of anything. All we have to do is find it, right? So that's beautiful. And we'll go over some techniques on, uh, on how to take advantage of that. And all standardized tests can be beaten using general test taking strategies. With the Princeton Review, um, if you are preparing for the SAT, or you're preparing for the MCAT, or an a AP exam, or the GRE, or whatnot, in your first couple of classes, it's going to be very similar, because they're all standardized tests, and they're all, there's some general strategies that apply to, to all of them. So the next time you have a multiple choice test in one of your classes, remember some of these, and we can outsmart the professor a little bit. All right, so um, your strategies are as important, if not more important, I think, than your scientific knowledge. That doesn't mean you're allowed, you get a hall pass here, you know, you, you gotta really, really learn. You're gonna need that, especially if you get in. <laughs> but um, you're gonna need the strategies as well. So a couple of strategies here, Re remember to, Manage your time. That's the single most important thing. I think manage your time and manage your stress. Um, the, that's paramount. And you're taking control of your time. You've just we've just defined it. Seven hours, 27 minutes, 95 minute sections, 59 questions. All right, we're on it. We're going to pace ourselves, and we're going to remember that we are in a marathon. The first person to finish loses in this marathon. I remember my, my daughter coming up to me <laughs> the first time in, in preschool and saying that she had a test and she was so proud of herself because she was the first one to turn it in. Um, and I just, you know, oh no, okay. <laughs> and so you mean you had 20 more minutes you could have worked on it to perfect it, but you didn't, okay. I love her. Um, all right, personal order of difficulty is is an absolute key strategy. Now, as I mentioned before, you can't jump around from section to section, right? But you can, within that section, answer the questions that are easiest to you based on your knowledge, based on your, your past, and what you're comfortable with. And, you know, like I said, a difficult question is not worth any more than an easy question. So identify the easy questions. Paramount to every multiple choice test is never, never pick the right answer. Always use process of elimination. And you're looking for things that are incorrect. Looking for what is wrong, right? And I'll show you some of that. Sounds a little weird, but I'll show you that. And it, you know, the MCAT's a, a test of scientific knowledge. But you're only going to succeed if you've got the strategy to go with that knowledge. So here is a, an example. Now, at the Princeton Review, we're all specialized. And so I'm, I'm no, is this chemistry? 
I'm no chemistry professor or teacher, right? But um, I, I can solve this question because which one of the following shows a possible Lewis structure for, for the rest of it, right? Okay, so um, if we look at this, we've got the, the, negative, the negative two here towards the end, right? Um, the, the, the two negative formal charges. So if we, if we look at this, we'll realize that the correct answer is going to have two negative formal charges. So which one of these has two? Now, I wish, sorry, the PowerPoint doesn't strike it out, but what I always do is look and strike it out. There's none, right? Here's, it's, it's not, you, you know, this isn't correct. This is four. This is the only thing that solves. Now, I don't know what dis, well, for disulfide intermediates are. I don't. I'm good at I'm good at tests. So here's the official explanation: the sum of formal charges of a molecule have to add up to the overall charge of the molecule. Yep. Okay. Now, here's another one um, from a passage about um, irritable bowel syndrome. So. How might Sigmund Freud have treated an IBS sufferer? Now, thank goodness it's multiple choice. So let's look at what the answer possibilities are here. So by helping the patient discover the physical cause of their symptoms through various stress tests, okay, stress tests, with a psychoanalytic approach that would attempt to pinpoint the root, okay, in a group therapy session with sufferers of other psychological disorders, Dr. Freud would be unlikely to treat an IBS sufferer because he would not consider their disorder to have a psychological cause. Okay, um, again, not a scientist. Yes, I've given this presentation before, so I know the answer from that, but it's pretty straightforward. If you're talking about Sigmund Freud and the only answer choice that is psychoanalytic is there, that's your answer. And if you look, the other ones are other scientific principles, okay? This is not Freudian psychology. A, C, or D are not Freudian. So, um, so just by looking at that question, not having the knowledge of IBS or much at all, just knowing Freud and knowing psychoanalytics. So there, there is some of your psychology. Now, I get questions a lot on, you know, Sean, how in the world could you get better at carbs? And okay, this is how. Now, this is the, I would take a screenshot, folks, because honestly, this is my out of my syllabus for my first three classes. So these are all ways that you are going to learn um, to navigate your way through the test and get the results that you want, whether or not you have the scientific knowledge. Yes, you you need it. I'm not discounting it, but you know, looking in the right co column already, we've talked about taking control and moving forward and backward through the questions, right? Process of elimination, not being attracted to an answer that looks right, but being, you know, being very discriminate about what you do um, and how you do it, getting rid of those, those answers that are incorrect. Remember, in cars, there's often not a correct answer anyway. So the, what, is mo what, what would most weaken, weaken the author's opinion about this? Or, you know, it, it's, it's literature and stuff. It's not math unfortunately um, you can learn to preview the passages so you look at the questions and then you read the passage you can identify what are called killer passages which are just time killers they're not worth your time at all and um, and there therefore not spend that time in, in four to six questions trying to read a passage that you can't understand and wasting your time so you just put that on to the end, you know, you've got a 25% chance getting it right. So guess at the hard ones. See this stuff, it, 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 it's pretty basic, right? When, like when you start to really break it apart. Um, take, the little, take notes on your not a dry erase board. And, um, and then, you know, look for things like extremes. And, you know, if something says all or never and, and you know, none, Usually that that answer is wrong. I mean, usually we're not talking about that that advance that critically. So getting into cars a little bit, everyone's favorite subject. 
Um, this is what a car's passage looks like. This and this. So all of these are applicable to the car section. And I encourage you to pick up one of our books or sign up for one of our, um, our trials online. I know they're dropping. We are giving away a full set of uh, study materials during this. Uh, after this, with if you register with the link that's in there for the Princeton Review. So I'm glad to send you that. But a uh, few tricks to this section. All right, the first thing is understand what you're looking at. So they all the AMC is not allowed to make up just just random passages and put them on a text. Um, they are excerpts. They can be everything from a poem to this tired old piece of work here, which is the J.J. Rousseau from, from Rousseau's The Social Contract. Fantastic. Some really old French uh, theory here. And as you can see, the, the passages, they, they should take you three to five minutes to go through, right, and to cover. And we don't really have time for that today. Um, so what I want to encourage you to do is, you know, enroll in a, a free uh, trial so you can take all practice tests and drills and everything. So there are things, though, ways that we know that we need to put into practice things I've just mentioned. Process of elimination. And let's look at process of elimination and extremes, okay? We have not read this passage. I, it's not, not that I recommend that, but... We can do this without reading the passage. Because right here, 28 says in the fourth paragraph, Rousseau employs the metaphor of war to achieve which the following. We can go straight to the fourth paragraph. We can see what, what Rousseau is doing in that. And we can see the trial by judgment. And we see, okay, and by attacking social rights, every malefactor by, okay, great. So I noticed something looking at this question and having read that. Okay, so this is going to be about the state. It's going to be about rebels and traitors and everything else. But that paragraph is a comparison. It's not a contrast. There's not a contrast between a rebel and a traitor. They're the same thing. There's not a contrast between the peaceful ideal of a state and a violent. There's no contrast at all in that paragraph. We are done. We are done. Because our answer, ah, why are you going backwards? Okay. Okay, great. So our answer is right here. It's the comparison. Simply by knowing, reading that there, it's a comparative paragraph, we know that contrast, contrast, contrast are incorrect, so we move on. Now, again, this is why you don't look for the correct answer. Because as it, this is a, a vocabulary and context question, which is why on that slide I told you to take a screenshot of, on the left column, there are 10, a row of, of 10 different names, and they're question types. There's only 10 types of questions that a test writer is allowed to ask you on this. And there's only 10 types of sentences in the English language, by the way. I'm such a nerd. So here, though, we need to recognize that any one of these could answer the question, what does sovereign mean? What is a sovereign? However, that's not the question. The question is, as it's used in the passage, the term sovereign means. So after having read that, you can see that a sovereign, a king is a sovereign, but this isn't, this isn't about a king. A higher being is a sovereign. This is not about higher being. A superior judge is mentioned, but this is not referred to as a sovereign. So that leaves us with the state. This is all about the state. So here in this example, we have four that could be right if you really haven't, haven't looked and you don't understand some of the cues. I'm not a big sports person, but I do see this as we are up at bat and there is someone pitching and we're trying to read that pitch. We've got to figure, what do you want? Like, what's coming at me? Curveball, fastball, what? So that we know how to hit it. It's, you know, trigger and response, however you want to call it. Um, but here, again, a great example of why 
you don't look at a question and then say, I know what a sovereign is. Sovereign's a king. king. No, not in this case, as it's used in the passage. So that's where a strategy can come in because having strategy, having studied this, when you see as it is used in the passage, you know this is a vocabulary and context question immediately. Now, based on the information in the passage is an inference question. So why is this so important, Sean? Like, okay, I get it. Like, I understand I need to know what pitch is coming at me so I know how to hit it. But then also on, on, on top of that, the um, when you're looking and you're previewing the questions to see which ones are harder, I mentioned personal order of difficulty, right? Well, some questions are going to be easier for you than others. Perhaps a specific uh, retrieval question of just go, you know, the author says what about this is best for you. Perhaps you're good at getting big, more general concepts. So you like main idea questions. So this is one of the reasons it's important to study and prep and understand what these questions are really asking you. So clearly we have the phrase, thank you test writer, based on information in the passage, which of the following opinions could most reasonably be ascribed to the author? Now, we haven't had time to read this, but folks, these, this is from a real MCAT test. Um, most of our content is licensed with the AAMC. A lot of the times when you're on our website, you will be directed to their site. Um, and then also they are a business, they are smart, they sell us tests when they are done with them. So these are real questions, folks. Are they great examples for this presentation? Yes, but they are real off of real tests. So I can show you another technique now to eliminate three of the answers and give us the right answer very quickly, right? We're gonna use our calculator instead of our long division here. So I'm going to start at the bottom again, my own order. This is my show. This is my MCAT. Individual rights are always protected by the state. Okay, always. I told you to watch out for those. Let's put that in the maybe file. Rousseau does not feel he's qualified to judge the actions of others. Okay, it's by this guy named R R Rousseau, right? We read that. So it sounds weird, but maybe. And all malefactors have a right to rehabilitation at the state's expense. All, huh? Okay. Well, I don't. I mean, it sounds a bit off anyway, but I don't like all. The rights of the individual are more important than the rights of the state. No. No one, that, this far, it's the opposite argument, if you've read it. And Who's going to argue for that anyway, that the rights of the individual are more important than the rights of the state? Who's going to be able to stand up and, and be like, yeah, Sean's more important than the United States? So that's not happening. So what we're left with is C. Rousseau doesn't feel he's qualified to judge the actions of others. And actually, when you go to the passage, look at the very last paragraph. But I feel my heart protesting and restraining my pen. Let us leave these questions to the just man who has never offended and has never himself stood in need of pardon. Pardon the gendered language, folks. It was 17 something. All right. So those are some of, of the ways that we can outsmart the, the, uh, the test with some strategy. Now, just a couple of quick things that I want to show you. Um, you know, you can take control of your entire process. We have this great um, tracking tool, the med medical school uh, management tool, and I stumble over it because it's brand new. And it was just announced to us a couple weeks ago, and it's amazing. Um, you, you can track, manage, and, and print. Um, okay, print, who cares? It, you can send it, you can link it to LinkedIn. You can, and you can export it in a file that is exactly what you need for your application or your medical school application with the AMC. So while you're getting all of this experience and everything, and we want you to go ahead and be keeping good track of it and not have to play catch up and build spreadsheets, um, but to have it all at your disposal. So in, in closing, I wanna say that, that you can 
get into the medical school that is right for you, right? And you need to think about all sorts of different, you know, things involving the school. Now you've been to college, you understand, you're gonna spend four years there. So you're gonna wanna pick a place that you wanna be for years, right? A place with a culture that you feel comfortable with and you like, that focuses on areas that you like to study and everything, and that you can get the MCAT score and the GPA score that you need. So with that, I will open it up to questions. I hope this wasn't a data dump. I hope that I was able to actually communicate some good strategies and good information about the test. And I will go ahead and take any questions. Now we have our wonderful Katie with Ross and ACU standing by and moderating. So, yeah, perfect. Hello. Jeff, are you there? Hi, Christina. Yeah, I'm here, and, and Christina's on too. We were able to get some technical things figured out. So, um, I, I do think we have a couple questions in the chat that I'll fire at you, Sean, if you don't mind, and then we'll have a few uh, items that Christina is going to address. Um, so, one of the questions uh, was about um, the use of or the testing of physics on the MCAT. And essentially, the question was what's the point of testing physics on the MCAT? Um, I think that there's probably a belief by some that, you know, it's not as much of a component uh, that is taught in medical school. So, if you could just speak to uh, to any of that, just as far as um, the uh, physics component of the MCAT. Yeah, so there's a really good point that you you bring up. You know, medical school is is, is not going to be physics focused, but they do want to make sure that you have the complete um, and well-rounded, comprehensive basics to go into this with. And you're going to need some of that physics not only in the physics section but in some of the other science sections as well. It's, it's all interconnected. So, you know, I, well, I see where you're coming from, but they're only looking for that, that baseline knowledge. Okay, uh, so there, uh, there was a question about math skills and, and what kind of math skills um, you feel like are going to be most uh, relevant for the exam. Wow, I don't think anyone's asked me that question before. That's a great question. Well, I, you shouldn't need much math. Um, I mean, the math that you're going to be doing is going to be the math that you're doing in your in your science classes now. Um, so, yes, you're going to go through mathematical processes, but while applying that to the sciences, if that makes sense, very similar to the to the physics. Um, so, and you're not going to be working out. Uh, any any mathematical mathematical problems. So really, just in your studies, and you know, as you look or at the MCAT material, you'll see how mathematics itself relates to the the different sections and where you'll need to apply it. But it's pretty basic math. Okay, so there's another question. When registering for the MCAT, um, do you have to indicate the universities you plan to apply to? I think this is a good question because it does give you the option, but you know that doesn't mean you can only apply there. But if you wanted to elaborate on that, Sean. Oh, no, go ahead. No, no, I, I guess I was just saying that like as far as being able to select, it's just like when you went back and you were taking the SATs or the ACTs, you're, you're able to select certain schools that you're planning to apply to. But once you get your score report back, you can still apply to other schools. Um, it, it would just, I, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sean, but I believe if you select those schools, the report goes directly to them um, once the score comes back rather than you having to actually provide the score report yourself. Is that right? That's correct. I couldn't have said it better myself. Okay. Yeah, I know some stuff. <laughs> so, uh, Sean, uh, you mentioned in there that um, that ninety percent of the people retake the MCAT, and um, I, I know that a lot of advisors, um, you know, really try to advise against too many attempts because it, it can potentially look bad depending on on where they're applying. Um, in the data that you've seen. Um, just, uh, I, I guess, speak to that uh, as far as why you think so many people are retaking the MCAT when it could potentially have an adverse effect on their medical school application. Oops, okay, so why are they taking it more than two times when when it may have a negative yeah, effect? I, I guess, I guess, um, I, I guess, why you think the statistics are so high at ninety percent when it could potentially have an adverse effect on on their application? Oh, sure. Um, I, I think it's a um, lack of a awareness about the test, about strategy, 
and and its approach. I think there's a a feeling out there that um, companies like the Princeton Review um, are 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 built on some sort of narrative or you know have some uh, angle or something, but really, um, it, everything that I just said over the last hour is abs is absolutely true. And people go in thinking, okay, well, I've done some Khan Academy, so I'm good to go. Or I've got a great grade point average. I, st I studied with my buddies. Um, this would be great, you know. And um, the other thing that I think is critical is to make sure that you're taking practice tests. Um, don't let your practice go on the record. And that's what a lot of a lot of folks are doing is they're saying, okay, well, I prep for this a little bit. I'm going to go in there. And I'm going to give it a go. And then, you know, if I have to go back a second time to take it, um, you know, then I will. I'll do some more preparing. My philosophy is don't even prepare until you've taken a free practice test. Um, take it with the AMC themselves, right? Don't trust anyone else. Just straight to the AMC. And, and then look at that test to see where you stand. And that test will not be going to recruiters. And that test will not be going to medical schools. And you can study some more. And you can take another practice test. And then when you're ready and you've, you've demonstrated, you've got the data that you're ready, then you go in there um, and nail that test. So. Yeah, so it seems like we, we still have some more questions about physics. I think people get a little bit caught up on this one. Um, I, and I'm not sure if you know this, Sean, but um, the question is, is the physics that's re that is tested on the exam more algebra-based or calculus-based? I honestly do not know the answer to that question. Yeah, I, 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 I've never had that question before, and I've been doing this a long time, um, and, and, and that's, that's going to be a tough one. And I, I think it's always important, Sean, and I think you probably agree, when you don't know the answer, just <laughs> you know, just say you don't know, and, and they can potentially probably do some more online research. But that, I, I do feel like it's a good question. I, I'm probably going to do some of that research uh, myself, yeah. uh, because, I, I mean, it's valid. Um, so oh, there's it's another question. Good Sorry, good question. Go ahead. I Surprised we haven't been asked before. This is my my email to whomever asked it. Um, if you want to email me the question, I will go to and I will find the expert and I will get you the right answer. But just like Jeff said, I'm never going to make something up. Uh, so and then th there was a question. I think this is a really good one. Um, and so a lot of people have this question, like if I haven't taken all of the re prerequisite courses. Um, would would that stop somebody from from being able to take the MCAT? And so uh, I, I think just speaking more to like what what does eligibility mean versus what does is being fully prepared mean? And so like yes, and, and I think you'd probably agree. Like if you haven't taken OCHEM two or if you haven't taken biochemistry, sure you potentially can go and take the MCAT, but should you? And I think that if you wanted to add anything, I guess to that point. No, I I, I think good. Uh, that that's spot on and i and i think that you know just going back to some of the things i said in the beginning where i said you know you only need um one semester of it but i recommend two you know just so you can move on you can really solidify and and in in the second parts of the class is often you'll be you know employing and and using and practicing the concepts you know from from the first part so um I think that yeah, even though it's not required, it's it's highly recommended and it'll help you a lot. Okay, so uh, there was one quick question about like being able to take the MCAT internationally. Do you know much about being able to take the MCAT outside of the U.S. and Canada and the like availability of that? I no, I do not. Um, I would go on amc.org and and search for that. I don't know where they test outside of the United States. Okay, and then uh, I think this is a really good question, and and one that uh, you know people at, at Princeton Review would, would want the people to want, want the people potentially taking the exam uh, to know the answer to because you can go to the library, you can get older material, prep materials, you can uh, potentially like order off eBay, like you know a, a ten year old uh, test prep book. Um, uh, just just speak to um, if you can. Um, what relevance some of that material would have and, and what reasoning a, a person might have for only wanting the most up-to-date materials? Yes, good question. So the, you can find materials laying around out there. I mean, I can tell you I have um, 
I have a storeroom full of books that if, that if I don't give them away, um, I'm going to have to recycle them because they're worthless next year. Um, and that'll be thousands of dollars worth of books. And hopefully I can get them out to people in time. So hopefully you guys are signing up um, for, for me to give them away to you. But yeah, um, it, it's even more, I think the testing industry moves along faster than even academia. So a lot of times, you know, my oldest daughter is at, at University of Central Florida. And, you know, honestly, she'll be like, okay, professor, do I really need the latest version of, can I get last year's edition? Or, you know, how will that work? And oftentimes it's like, yeah, they just change the forward um, or they're, you know, they're just trying to, you know, get some more money out of you. Um, but the testing works so rapidly and it changes, uh, it changes and it and evolves constantly. And it has to do so in order to not get stagnant, to be, uh, you know, competitive, to be, to be standardized, but not asking the same things over and over again and to remain relevant and to change with the times. So I can find you material where the MCAT is scored on a scale of 15 to 45 as well. You know, so you just have to be really careful and make sure that you're working with with this year's. This this industry, the test prep industry, moves much faster than universities and, and colleges. Okay, and, and uh, I, I'm going to make this the last question, just in the interest of time, because I know that we have a couple of slides we wanted to get through on the AUC Ross side as well. I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, and, and this is a tough one to answer, and I know we get this question about other schools in the Caribbean, other uh, medical schools, other international schools. And so there was a question in here, and I think I think it's valid to ask, and, and you don't necessarily have to talk down about uh, any, any competitive uh, uh, competing programs, but I, I guess I would just want to know how Princeton Review sees itself in, in the test prep materials in the course by comparison to some of the others in the market. It's a great question. I think that there are some good there's some good players in the market. The reason that I chose to go teach for the Princeton Review was mostly because we they have a specialist in every area. So I really, I, I taught SAT and ACT as well, which are, are generalized, right? And if you did really well on them and, you know, years later you study how to, how to teach and, and, and you can teach those, you know, that prep, that's pretty general high school stuff. But you know, I get to be um, a specialist in my area and I know a lot about cars. And I'm working with folks who know everything about physics and everything about the biology. And we get to learn all of the trends and study absolutely everything that's going on within those fields. So with the Princeton Review, when you're taking a course or you're reading content, that was written by a specialist. It's being taught by a specialist. And that's not such a foreign concept. I mean, ask yourself, when is the last time you had one teacher that taught you every subject? Was it fourth grade, third grade? So while I think that there are some good players out there, I don't think anybody can match what the Princeton Review does in terms of um, its teaching resources, it's um, publishing division with Rob Frenick and partnership with Random House Books. Um, and it's relation, it's sister company, Tutor.com, which has finished its 20 million tutorial. So we're a jargonaut. We've been around for a while, but we're very individualized. And uh, I think that, that that's really what gives us the edge. Uh, thanks uh, so much, Sean. I, I think so. I, so we've got Christina on now, and, and she's going to run through a couple of her slides. Um, so are you going to help us just click through those for her, and then uh, if there's any questions for us, maybe um, you know we can we get to those at the end. Absolutely. Could Perfect. you guys hear me? Could you hear me? Yep. Hi there, everybody. Thank you so much for joining, Sean. That was extremely thorough, very informative, and uh, entertaining. I chuckled several times throughout your presentation. So thank you for that. My name is Christina Collada. I'm the Associate Director uh, for Student and University Partnerships. And this webinar was presented to you by AUC and Ross, Better Together. So uh, Sean, if you could change the slide. 
So together, uh, students, we have over 40 years. We've been around for over 40 years. We have an established history. We also have combined over 20,000 alumni, 20,000 alumni. And I always tell the students when I present that we are looking at your metrics and you should be looking at our metrics. So, um, for example, American University of the Caribbean, we've had 340 residency placements during 2019 and 2020. Uh, Sean, if you could keep clicking, I think you could click maybe one more time. We have a 92% first time residency match rate, and we have a 94% USMLE first time uh, pass rate. That is for the American University of the Caribbean. And on Ross, there are more uh, metrics. Sean, could you change it one more time? Uh, and click two more times just to have all the numbers on there. Okay, so Ross University School of Medicine, 597 residency placements uh, during 2019 and 2020. We have a 95.2 um, first time residency match rate. And Sean, is there one more click? No, is there. That all? Okay, so to sum up again, uh, over 40, 40 year history and over 20,000 alumni. So thank you students for joining. Thank you, Sean, for presenting. Thank you very much. Thank you for having us. If anybody has any questions, please reach out to these great experts with you. And have a wonderful yeah. evening. Yeah, and thanks, Sean. And just remember, everybody that's attending, we're going to be sending out today's uh, webinar along with the links for um, for Princeton Review, all of the wonderful products that uh, they offer for, for MCAT prep with some special discounts for anybody that attended or is listening to the recording of tonight's webinar. Um, and that's it. So on behalf of the, the group at American University of Caribbean and Ross University School of Medicine and the Princeton Review, thank you for attending tonight. Please make sure that you uh, let us know if you have any last questions in the chat and we will definitely reach out to you and have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Bye.